I'm going to start with a question. Is bureaucracy a good thing or a bad thing? Most, most organizations include at least some bureaucracy in their structure. Rules, policies, procedures, approval processes, levels of authority. And if the truth be told, an organization can't function properly without a certain degree of bureaucracy. In itself, and applied with wisdom, bureaucracy is helpful and good. One comment I read on the internet said, bureaucracies can help organizations run smoothly and efficiently. The problem for many organizations, both commercial and non-commercial, is that they unwittingly fall into the trap of bureaucracy gone mad or out of control. The rules, policies, procedures, approval processes, levels of authority take precedence over all else at the expense of progress and development, common sense, and even compassion, mercy, grace, love. Now, I don't want to get, any, get into any political debate, but listen to this headline from the Guardian newspaper just a few weeks ago. Ukrainian refugees face added trauma of UK's bureaucratic nightmare. In, in many eyes, the UK government were perceived as putting bureaucratic rules ahead of the urgency to show compassion, mercy, grace and love towards desperate and vulnerable people who were fleeing from a war. The reporter Andrew Hindle wrote, no other country is imposing such stringent checks on these people. Now, bureaucracy is not a modern concept. It goes back many centuries. After God provided the Israelites with an es escape route out of Egypt, he gave Moses a set of rules for them to follow. Initially, the Ten Commandments. Then, numerous rules, the law, about how they should live a godly life. The law was designed for the Israelites to live together in harmony, but more importantly, to live lives that reflected their love for God. The leaders of the Pharisees were very well acquainted with the law. But over the years, they'd lost sight of it, of its, of its good purpose, and therefore how they should apply it to their own lives and the lives of others. Their interpretation and application of the law had become very bureaucratic, or for want of a better word, legalistic. Hence the confrontation between them and Jesus in our passage from Matthew's Gospel today. Confrontation is usually depicted as something negative, but there's often something positive that can be, can be learned from a negative situation. So what do we learn from this confrontation between the Pharisees and Jesus? There's three things I'd like to highlight. The first one is how Jesus dealt with the legalism of the Pharisees. And then how Jesus dealt with the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. And finally, the real reason why the Pharisees were so angry with Jesus. So first, how Jesus dealt with the legalism of the Pharisees. Please do keep an eye on the first eight verses of Matthew chapter 12. I'm not going to read them all, but I will be referring to them as we go. These verses can be split into two sections. One we'll call the cornfield incident, and the other we'll call the shriveled hand. Sounds like a horror movie, doesn't it? In, in the cornfield incident, starting at verse 1, Jesus' disciples pick some ears of corn and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, I'm not sure how the Pharisees saw this, because corn normally grows quite tall. 
up to eight feet or so, even taller than me. They were obviously keeping a close watch on him. But also continuing in, in verse 2, the Pharisees make an exclamation that sounds like a child grasping on a brother or sister. They said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Their accusation is based on the command not to work on the Sabbath in Exodus 20 and verses 8 to 11. Jesus responds with no less than three references to the Old Testament, emphasizing the importance he attached to the Old Testament. First of all, in verses 3 to 4, he refers to an incident when King David and his men ate consecrated bread given to them by Ahimelech, the priest. You can read about it in 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 to 6. But basically, David and his men were in need of sustenance, and the only food available was some consecrated bread that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced with hot bread. Strict adherence to the law says that both David and the priest committed an unlawful act, displeasing to God. But there's no record of God rebuking them. And Jesus rubber stamps the incident by using it to defend his disciples' actions. The point Jesus is making is that the need to satisfy hunger, the need to show compassion and mercy, was greater than the need to strictly uphold the law, legalism. And Jesus' second reference to the Old Testament in verse 5 is more general. He alludes to the fact that the priests continued with their daily work on the Sabbath, but were not held guilty for doing so. And thirdly, Jesus quotes the famous words of the prophet Hosea, I desire mercy not sacrifice, to cement his argument that the purpose of the law is to promote love, compassion, mercy, and grace, not to legalistically hold God's people in some kind of bondage. This wasn't the first time Jesus quoted Hosea to the Pharisees. Not long before the cornfield incident, he was challenged by the Pharisees about his willingness to eat with tax collectors and sinners. In his response, in Matthew 9 and verses 12 to 13, he told them to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. They clearly didn't learn. Otherwise, they wouldn't have challenged him and his disciples about picking and eating corn on the Sabbath. Jesus was prepared to rebuke the Pharisees over their attitude towards tax collectors and sinners, and he was equally prepared to rebuke them for their attitude in this instance. Verse 7, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. Jesus is holding the Pharisees to account for failing in their ministry. Instead of providing spiritual care and leadership to the people of Israel, They're weighing them down with burdensome rules and regulations that misinterpret God's intentions in the law. Their accusation against Jesus' disciples is further evidence that they don't grasp God's will. They don't understand God's heart for his people. They were holding on to religious traditions and legalism, giving them precedence over showing mercy to the people under their care. And staying with the cornfield incident for a moment, what the disciples were doing wasn't illegal. They weren't stealing. In those days, it was perfectly acceptable to glean in another person's field or vineyard, as long as you didn't take any more than what you needed for yourself and your family. This way the poor got fed and the field or vineyard owner didn't suffer much financially. The fact that the disciples needed to glean because of hunger implies 
that they were suffering poverty to some degree. In Matthew 19 and verse 27, Peter declares to Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. We know that some of them were fishermen, and Matthew was a wealthy tax collector. Most of the others probably had occupations that also provided a decent income. But knowing and following Jesus caused a major change in their lifestyles. In their cases, they had to leave everything to follow him. Now, I'm not saying that financial poverty is a prerequisite for following Jesus, and neither is leaving home and going to different places. Jesus' calling on our lives varies from person to person. But what I am saying is that following Jesus requires a willingness to change, to develop soft hearts of love, compassion, and mercy. Instead of embracing Jesus and his teaching, the Pharisees treated him as the enemy. Their legalistic attitude prevented them from acknowledging Jesus for who he is. They were not prepared to change their hard hearts. And we must take care that we don't stubbornly harden our own hearts against Jesus' call on our lives. So, Undeterred, Jesus and his disciples continue on to the synagogue where the Pharisees have another go at him. Once again, though, he turns the tables on them and this time he deals with their hypocrisy through the incident of the shriveled hand. If you'd like to keep an eye on uh, verses 10 to 14 now, we'll start with uh, verse 10. A man with a shriveled hand was there Looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? The Pharisees looked at this man and saw an opportunity to set a Jesus Sabbath trap. And as we'll see in a moment, Jesus looked at him and saw a human being in need of love, compassion and mercy. As he often did, Jesus responds to their question with a question. Verse 11, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? He doesn't wait for an answer because he knows the answer. Instead, he continues in verse 12, how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus doesn't condemn them for rescuing a sheep on the Sabbath. He thinks it's right that they should do it. But his point is that if it's okay for them to rescue their sheep on the Sabbath, how can they think it's unlawful to help a much more valuable human in need? He exposes their hypocrisy. Read Matthew 23 about the seven woes when you get home today and you'll see how hypocritical Jesus thought the teachers of the law and the Pharisees were. In six of the seven woes, he calls them hypocrites and in the seventh, he calls them blind guides. And while it's okay for Jesus to criticize the Pharisees, we need to be careful about doing it. It's easy to see the faults the negative in people. But I put it to you that there is at least some Pharisee in all of us. Hypocritical, legalistic, hard-hearted, change resistors. Perhaps today is a good day for each of us to consider to what extent we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And pray that the Holy Spirit would minister to us and change our hearts to be more compassionate, more merciful, more gracious, and more loving towards others. The compassion, mercy, grace, and love of Jesus led him to do good on the Sabbath and heal the man's shriveled hand. A twofold miracle. First, in its shriveled state, the man wouldn't have been able to stretch out his hand by himself. Jesus must have enabled him to stretch it out. 
And second, Jesus completely restored his hand, much to the annoyance of the Pharisees. Jesus and his disciples' actions on the Sabbath day, plus other things that Jesus had said and done thus far in his ministry, obviously irritated the Pharisees. Up to now, their tactic was to find fault. But this latest episode seems to have really rubbed them up the wrong way, big time. So much so that in verse 14, they went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. So what was it that rubbed them up the wrong way so much? What was the real reason why the Pharisees were so angry with Jesus? The answer is the thing that Jesus claims in verses 6 and 8, confirmed by uh, Matthew in verses 15 to 21. Verse 6, Jesus says, I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. He's talking about himself. In the context of the cornfield incident, he's saying that if the priests in the temple were considered innocent when doing their work in the temple on the Sabbath, then his disciples were also innocent when working on the Sabbath because they were working for him, who is greater than the temple. The temple had always been extremely highly regarded by the Jews. It was the place where they went to worship God and to offer sacrifices. It was a place for God's presence, built by King David's house, God dwelling among his people. There was no greater place than the temple. And certainly no human could possibly be greater than the temple. So Jesus' statement that he is greater than the temple would have been extremely shocking, outrageous. It was, in fact, a claim to his deity that he is God. Also, keeping the Sabbath holy is a concept, a commandment that was instituted by God himself. No human being could be Lord of the Sabbath. But Jesus says in verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Only God is Lord of the Sabbath. So by inference, Jesus is again declaring his deity, that he himself is God. This is all getting the Pharisees more and more agitated. Up to now, through his teaching and miracles, Jesus has spoken with authority. He has acted with authority. He's put his money where his mouth is. Many people are following him. The Pharisees are jealous and afraid of him. They see him as a threat to their own positions and status. But their biggest gripe is Jesus' claim to be greater than the temple and Lord of the Sabbath, God. They find him offensive and blasphemous to the point of deserving death. In our uh, Old Testament reading today, God tells Moses that he will raise up a prophet to replace him through whom God will speak to the Israelites. Deuteronomy 18 and verses 18 to 19, God says, or God has said to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. Now, two Sundays ago, we read from Deuteronomy 17 that God would give the Israelites a king of his choosing. And last Sunday, we read about priests, the Levites, that God had already chosen. The prophet would also be one chosen by God. And then from then on, throughout Israel's history, God raised up a prophet for every king who would relate God's commands to him. Sadly, the kings and the people often didn't listen to the prophets because they didn't like their messages from God. 
hence the turbulent history that the Israelites have. Nevertheless, there were three roles, all chosen by God, to lead, guide, and minister to his people. King, prophets, and priests. So coming back to uh, Matthew 12, in verses 18 to 21, the Gospel writer is clearly claiming that Jesus is the fulfillment of a prophecy from Isaiah. Isaiah 42, 1 to 4 to be precise. He recognizes that the servant chosen by God in whom the nations will put their hope is none other than the one who is greater than the temple and Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ, God the Son. In him, we see all three roles combined. King, to lead God's people. Prophet, to guide God's people. And priest, to minister to God's people. And more than that, Jesus is the messianic redeemer who both Moses, Isaiah, and other prophets pointed to. He's the one in whom his followers will put their hope for an eternity in the presence of the one true living God. So Jesus confronted the Pharisees over their legalistic attitude. He challenged them about their hypocrisy. It's always difficult to be confronted or challenged about anything. The Pharisees didn't take it well. Especially when Jesus declared his deity and displayed his power and authority. In fact, their hearts hardened even more to the point of wanting rid of Jesus. Sadly, nothing has changed over the years. We live in a world that has largely hardened its heart against Jesus. I know many people who have rejected Jesus. I'm sure you know some as well. So if we believe that Jesus is greater than the temple, Lord of the Sabbath, king, priest, and prophet rolled into one, the messianic redeemer, if we believe these things, then it is vital that we demonstrate this faith with true Sabbath observance, compassion, mercy, grace, and love the love of Christ, doing good, not just on the Sabbath, but every day. Following Jesus faithfully is a great witness to our lost world, and it's very pleasing to our one true living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray.